because this sure. is a video interview and it will go out as a video. So uh, this is, you are, this is Charles Brooks. Uh, he's a photographer. He specializes in phot uh, photographing musicians and also musical instruments. Um, and if this is your, I mean, why I wanted to talk to you um, was like, you have a series called Architecture, wait, Architecture and Music. Architecture, architecture and music, yes, architecture that's right. Architecture and music, yeah. where you where you take pictures of the insides of musical instruments, and do something absolutely ingenious with them, which makes them look like the insides of tunnels and caves and yeah. buildings. <laughs> yeah, and how you do it, but it's really it's really intriguing. I, I think it was especially the the photo of the cello. The yeah, that the that's been by far my my most popular shot. So this. Um, the series came about when I was, uh, normally I photograph concert musicians. I've been doing that for a long time. Um, but of course, you know, the whole world locked down, um, including New Zealand. And um, the musicians that I were, was photographing in New Zealand, they were typically artists who were performing overseas. So they might have been opera singers with, with Covent Garden or the Met or, or wherever, some fantastic cellists. Um, but those guys were either stuck here with no work or stuck overseas um, also with no work. So no one was in the position to, to sort of commission portraits. And so I turned the camera towards the things that have surrounded me for my whole life, um, which of course are, are classical music instruments and particularly the cello, because I was a, a concert cellist for 20 years. I, I played with orchestras in China and Chile and Brazil and, you know, it's a massive part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, so you, and, were, yeah, the, you were an orchestral player or were you a soloist? Yes, I was an orchestral player. So um, principal cellist in, in most of the orchestras I was with. So Shenzhen Symphony, the Guayang Symphony, Orchestra de Camera de Valdivia, which is in the middle of Patagonia in Chile, just to, you know, I've played in some weird places. And then finally, uh, my last job was with the Sao Paulo Symphony in Brazil. Fantastic orchestra, absolutely wonderful. But for me, it was, um, you know, it's a very, very high pressure situation. Um, and any of your, your, you know, professional musician audience would understand that, you know, performing in a, in a massive symphony with a, we had a massive symphonic program and an opera program, um, 12 operas a year. Um, and it's, it's so intense. It's also, uh, I have to say a little bit of a toxic environment. Mm -hmm. There's just so much pressure on you all the time. And it, it felt a little bit like living the film whiplash day in, day out. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think I'd burnt out. Um, and I'd, I'd done photography, you know, alongside this um, as a sort of release from, you know, that, that pressure of the, the classical music world. Um, and so, you know, I turned to that and, and that became my career. Um, but I haven't lost the, that classical music connection. So almost everything I photograph has some kind of connection to classical music and I'm heavily biased towards cellos. Uh, so the, the particular image that you're, you were talking about there, um, you know, I, I, I had this idea to look inside instruments. Um, there's some new technology, some new lenses that had come out that are sort of these long probe lenses that you can fit in little holes. And it just so happened that there was a really fascinating instrument that came in to repairs to friends of mine that are luthiers here. And this was a 1780 Lockie Hill cello. So Lockie Hill is from the Hill and Sons family in England. They were their greatest um, instrument makers for you know, a period of about 100 years. Um, and this was one of his last instruments that he made before he was executed for horse theft, okay. um, which is not the story that you usually get with a, you know, with a fine instrument, but, um, <laughs> a little bit grim, but the instrument, um, itself was, it's just exceptionally beautiful. Um, and when I looked inside, I, I had an idea of what I was going to see. I, I know what's in an instrument, you know, you've got a sound post, you've got a bass bar, you've got these things, but... I realized that you could see the the tool marks you could see almost like the fingerprints of the maker in there so it's revealing this whole personality to the instrument that you wouldn't normally see um and there was so much detail in this instrument that i thought you know i 
I want to capture it all. I want everything to be crisp and in focus so that you can explore the inside of the entire instrument. Because you make it, um, you really make it look like a room. You yeah, so this was sort of a, uh, this was almost accidental. Um, what I used was a, a technique called focus stacking, because when you're dealing with very small spaces like this, um, you have a, a problem that the thing you've focused on is sharp, but it's a very, very shallow depth of field. So anything even slightly behind it or slightly in front of it blurs out really, really quickly. And I had this idea that maybe if I just take an awful lot of photos, changing the focus from front to back, and then blend them together, maybe that'll make it crisp all the way throughout. And I had to find special software to be able to do this, come up with some special techniques for lighting and so on. Um, but it worked really well. And a, a sort of unintended side effect of this is that because everything's in focus, your brain assumes that well, it can't be small. If it was small, it would be out of focus. So now I must be looking at something big. So you get this fantastic optical illusion that it's this enormous space. And to me, it's almost as if the instrument has been turned inside out. It, it becomes its own concert hall yes, because a lot of these it spaces. Like yeah. I also thought it looked a bit like a luthier's workshop. Yeah, I mean, people have said it, it looks like a barn. An awful lot of people said it, it looks like an apartment they can't afford. Um, <laughs> you know. yeah. Part of the, the, the thrill for me of the series is that it's going, you know, it's gone a little bit viral and um, it's reaching a lot of people that are not classical musicians and that are experiencing these instruments for the first time. And so you get all kinds of crazy comments. A, a surprising number of people want to skateboard through a, a clarinet. Yeah. Um, yes, well, let's but, talk about the clarinet one, because that is, I mean, I mean, obviously you'd apply the same technology to that. And, and that is amazing because it looked, that, that I feel like made me think of Alice in Wonderland, you know, going through the, yeah. The the, yeah. the the shoot, you know, where she falls down the hole. Yeah, it, it, the, a lot of them have a, a sort of almost science fiction feel to them because you know especially with the clarinet um i, I photographed um a bass clarinet just a few days ago and you've got this fantastic metal at the end of it that bounces the light if you if you can do it right it took me a while to figure out it bounces the light back through the instrument with this kind of warm yellow glow so you start out with this incredible black african hardwood which actually isn't pure black. Um, at this level, you can see these flecks of brown and, and sort of white in this incredibly tight grain of this beautiful wood. And then it just fades to this orange yellow glow in the center. It, it looks like a, a, something out of a, an Arthur C. Clarke, you know, cover for, for one of his science fiction books or something. Um, quite yeah, and, and it's interesting. For me, that's kind of exciting because, you know, um, part of the the whole world of classical music people have uh, this very preconceived idea of of what it is it's it's old instruments in old concert halls and and you know a lot of people who don't listen to cla classical music will will say oh yeah i enjoy classical music it's so relaxing um and generally i i want to turn around at them and just say you're so wrong <laughs> you know in a in a thousand years of music, I can think of maybe three pieces that I would call relaxing. The rest of it is, you know, thrilling, exciting, tragic, every other thing. And and so I want to present these instruments in a way that's that's new and exciting and engaging um, and hopefully get some more people just just interested in, in this whole art form and the artworks themselves, the instruments themselves that are so incredible. Mm -hmm. And reveal some of the drama in the music through the drama in the the visuals, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's always been my my goal with my musician portraits as well. Um, they tend to to not be, you know, simple portraits of someone holding an instrument. Usually, it's it's on fire or they're levitating or something like this. Because I, you know, visuals are often people's first um, interaction with a musician, with a performer they'll see a poster for a concert or something will come up on Facebook with the sound turned off. So that visual has to be totally arresting or they're not going to, to explore it anymore. And I think that's something, you know, us musicians, we, we spend so much time perfecting our craft and perfecting the sound. 
but people have to have gone through a process before they're even going to sit down and listen. And um, for me, the, you know, an arresting visual image is a really integral part of, a, should be an integral part of any performer's portfolio so that they can get themselves out there to more people. Funny, I was talking to somebody about really this, I suppose. Um, he runs a, a, a series of concerts in London and he was saying that most of their ticket sales now are based on about 10 seconds worth of of Instagram videos. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's that's the thing. I should do some video with this. I've yet to figure out how to turn these into a video. Some of the, the piano shots in particular where we're looking down the action of the keys. Um, I, I think, it, wouldn't it be thrilling if you could see that all moving? Um, the problem at the moment is for me to get that all in focus takes two hours and a hundred photos and I, I can't possibly do it in real time with video but I am working with some new technologies I've been in touch with a, a neurosurgeon in the USA and various technology companies through Lumix and, and other providers and we're looking at um, some sort of high-end medical endoscopes and various other equipment that we can maybe get into more difficult positions and there might be the possibility in the future to, to do some video work with that which which I think would be amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder if you think that classical music is becoming more visual now than say I don't know even just 10 years ago or, or 20 years ago perhaps because of social media or that's just what I, I'm more interested in now. I think it has, and I, and I think it has to be. And there's a, a bit of a sort of kickback amongst the more traditional classical community um, for some of that. I remember the, the, the outrage at some of Yu Jia Wang's dresses that she would wear. Um, but she commands one of the largest audiences in, in the classical music world. Um, you know, I, I played with Lang Lang many, many times, and I found his kind of bouncing around on the chair really distracting. I had to sort of close my eyes, you know, unless there was an important cue where I really had to follow him visually. Um, but I, I think that's just my preconceptions. People love them, and they are, are feeding a new generation of audience here, which is absolutely critical. So. You know, that's visual in the concert hall, but I, I think you also need, you know, um, TikTok videos and all these kind of things just to, to get those people in. Because, you know, I, I have been to an awful lot of concerts where the audience is really, really old. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, you know, how long is that going to be sustainable? And, you know, this has been a debate that's been going on in classical music for ages. If I had all the answers, um, I'd be running a massive successful orchestra somewhere. I, I don't, but I think that um, maybe, you know, the kind of visuals that I'm doing and, and just getting something kind of interesting and arresting like that is is a start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose there will be the two camps. There'll be one camp which will argue that maybe this focus on the visuals will encourage a kind of superficiality, you know, and it will take, it will distract from, from, from the listening. Whereas, whereas some people might say it actually will actually help people to engage with the music to to a greater extent. Yeah, I, I mean that's a that's a tough argument, and it could go either way. But for me, I've I've always you know when I was a musician, I was always particularly visual. So, in order to get myself in in the right mood for a particular piece, I would create a scene in my head. And I'd be imagining almost a, like a movie trailer when I was playing. Um, and, uh, you know, when I go to photograph classical musicians, what I'll typically do is ask them, you know, what's a piece that you're known for or, or that you particularly love and would use that as a starting point. And I think when people have that kind of um, visual aspect running through whatever they're doing, it, it helps them perform better. Um, and it, it, you know, obviously that is going to, to reach the audience better as well. And then if you can turn that into a real visual, uh, then you've got something great because it, it's something that's integral to the music. It's from the music. Um, it, it doesn't work with every single piece, but there's a lot out there that, you know, you can apply that technique to. Yeah. But I mean, what I think is so fascinating about your photos, particularly of the of the insides of the instruments, is because the, 
I don't know, as a violin player myself, I was always really intrigued about what was underneath the F holes. You know? yeah. And well, I was clear into is, the F holes. This is something for me as well. I mean, you, you can only see so much from that angle. And I think in, in my 20 years as an orchestral orchestral cellist, I got to look inside the instrument properly, maybe twice. And that was when it was going in for major repairs. Um, so I, I never saw the, the kind of detail that I can with this, the techniques that I'm using now. And it's unusual to me to, to, you know, I was so familiar with this instrument, yet I realized that I, I hardly knew it. And now I can see all this detail, all these repairs, all this interest going through there. And um, it sort of brings me closer to the instrument itself, which is something that I didn't think was possible after playing it for such a long time. But it's it's really thrilling. Yeah, it's a sort of it's a hidden it's a hidden world, isn't it? Uh, and can I ask a little bit about your how you got into photography in the first place? I mean, it, you look like you've been doing it since you were f four years old or something. <laughs> yeah, not quite four, but um, maybe about fifteen. Mm -hmm. So I, I started it at high school, and um, that was back in the days of film. Um, and even then, you know, the first thing I photographed was my cello. And I wish I had some of those those photographs left. I was doing crazy double exposures, but all those negatives have been lost. Um, and, you know, I had a, a sort of natural talent for it, but the cello took over. Um, you know, to be a, a concert musician, you've got to give absolutely your entire life to it. There's no time for anything else, especially at the beginning when you're, you know, out there studying at university, doing auditions, competitions, all that kind of thing. Um, and so I had to put the camera aside. But then I, I found myself, um, you know, one of my first jobs was in China. And um, I went to join an orchestra there. And this orchestra, this was the Shenzhen Symphony in China, and they played an awful lot for the army. Um, I think they got a lot of extra money whenever they did those jobs. So they'd fly us all over China to some of the most remote places, you know, the borders of Uzbekistan and, and Kyrgyzstan and, and the far north of China and the deserts of the Taklamakan and you're just surrounded by all this, you know, extraordinary beauty. So I couldn't help but but get my camera out again. So this was in about 2006. So I'd, I'd put my camera down for a long time. Yeah. Um, and then um, <clears throat> I left China, went to um, Patagonia to kind of get as far away from China as possible. I'd, I'd had enough of my time there. And Patagonia is this extraordinary wilderness, started taking landscapes. Um, and it's, it's such a beautiful place down there. You can just sort of put your camera on automatic and point it backwards over your shoulder and National Geographic want to run it. Um, it's just an exceptional environment. Um, did that for a while, started picking up the skills. But then I went to Brazil and Sao Paulo is a an amazing city, a beautiful city, but also a dangerous city. Um, a surprising number of the musicians in that orchestra drove bulletproof cars um, because there was always the risk of being robbed or carjacked on the way home from, um, you know, a concert. And so I couldn't take my camera outdoors. I couldn't do the landscape photography that I, I had been doing. And that's when I really started focusing in again on musicians and instruments. And I'm glad I did because it it made me really kind of refine my technique and, and it's made me start photographing things that, you know, an awful lot of people photograph landscapes, mm -hmm. but not as many are, are sort of that deep in the world of classical music. and with my knowledge of the musicians and the instruments and what they were playing that added to what I was able to do as a photographer. Um, and yeah, I've been doing that ever since. So what is your, what are you, what are you planning next then? Are you, are you going to continue on this series and which instruments are you going to do? Um, I'm, I'm definitely continuing with the series. There's been so much interest in it. Um, people love it. So I'd like to make a book out of this eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, Ideally, I'd, I'd go through every major orchestral instrument. Um, some of them I've still got to figure out how do I make that photograph particularly interesting because especially a lot of the brass instruments, you're essentially just photographing a long tube and if there's no 
sort of valves or openings, um, they can all start to look like one another. So I've got to find a, a creative way around that. Mm -hmm. um, there's also issues with getting in to some of the instruments. So getting into a cello is fine. Getting into a violin is much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So we're working with, with new technologies and new cameras. Um, so I think this is going to be a, a years long um, process. But, uh, you know, it's it's exciting. There's an endless number of instruments to photograph. And I, I'd like to maybe photograph some sort of more off the wall things as well. Um, wonderful, like, pianola player pianos where you've got this mm. mix of wooden valves and, you know, um, sort of industrial stuff alongside classical things. Um, Eastern instruments, you know, uh, I was looking at an oud yesterday which um, the sound hole has this extraordinary pattern carved into it. And if we can find in a way into the body of that one, it should be really exciting because the patterns of the light coming through that should be unlike anything else. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much I can do with this and, and it's thrilling every day because I, I get to, you know, I get my hands on these exquisite instruments and, and get to play around with them. It's wonderful. Yeah, there, there's so much potential there and so much, so many challenges. Like imagine if you started going down and uh, trying, trying to photograph an organ, for example, or mm. <laughs> it'd keep you busy for the rest of your life. <laughs> they definitely. And, and we're using some different techniques as well. So uh, some of the more recent ones that I've photographed, we've been using a, an extremely high resolution camera for this. So the idea is once I've got some exhibitions up and running. So I think the first one will be in July in New Zealand um, this year. We're going to find a way to print those two or three meters high and five or six meters long so that when you're standing there, you really do feel like you are inside the instrument. And I, I think that's the the idea that, that you can kind of inhabit the space. Gosh, wow. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing how, how, how it turns out. And can I ask, do you still play your cello? A little bit. Um, not as much as I would have liked, because um, it turns out that being a professional photographer is almost as time consuming <laughs> as being a professional cellist. Um, and the other thing is, well. yeah, you know, when I play at the moment, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of years out of, you know, off my peak, um, I get a little bit frustrated because I can't play the way that I used to. And I know that if I wanted to to perform that way again, I'd need to be playing six to eight hours a day, every day, um, you know, like I did in my professional career. And I, I just can't do that. So it's been in its case for a little while. Um, I'm just getting to the point now where I think, you know, maybe I can just pull it out for fun and just play around and I don't have to be the best anymore. It's it's taken a long time to kind of sort of switch off that competitive nature because that was so important to actually gaining positions. You had to be fiercely so competitive. It's really yeah. You. yeah. Yeah. Whereas now maybe maybe I can relax a bit and, and just do it for fun, but we'll see how that goes. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. Well, I wish you all the best with, with, the photography, the cello, one or the other, both. I don't know. Um, and uh, it's it's been so it's been so nice speaking to you. I mean, the way I came came across your 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 photos in the first place, my husband just showed me a picture of one of them, and I thought, this guy, I've I've got to get him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I'm I'm glad you like it, and and you know, there's been a tremendous response, and every time I pick up a new instrument, it's it's different and exciting. Um, and, you know, there's a few that have sort of completely blown my mind. When I took the photo inside a didgeridoo, I had no idea what to expect, but was suddenly, you know, I was expecting maybe something carved out with stone tools or, or so on, um, with a lot of chisel marks, and instead it had this kind of alien landscape because it turns out they're entirely carved out by termites, um, not by hand. Um, and so each one of those, of course, is completely different as well. Um, it looks like a, a weird sort of alien tunnel, almost like something from a, an HR Giga artwork. Um, and, you know, so there's, there's so much to explore. It's so exciting. And um, I, I just enjoy presenting these these new views to people. And hopefully I'll be doing it for a long time. Yeah, and I guess it draws people's attention to how, how these instruments are 
are, are formed in the first place you know, because I mean I'm, I'm sure that many of the people who are looking at the photos didn't know that they were they were hollowed out by termites either yeah yeah I, I mean look I, I I studied in Australia I I played alongside to tree twos so I had no idea um that they should promote that more it's so interesting um but it's the same with the with the cellos you know with the the locky hill cello you when you're looking in you can see not just the marks of the the maker and the tools that he was using but you can see the repairs that have been done throughout the centuries um bits of old wood against bits of new wood and it sort of brings to light that you know it's not just about the performer and not even the luthier there's this whole chain of people involved in the life cycle of one of these instruments and i think that is hidden away from the public mm -hmm. um and I, I think you know it would be lovely if people knew more about what went into maintaining one of these extraordinary works of art mm, yeah well that's yeah that, that's something that's that you're definitely drawing attention to and uh yeah and, and i i hope you continue to do so and th thanks you so much charles for for speaking to me um, no, it's and been my